You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Love Cast at savage.love. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Love Cast. On May 31st in 2018, a new production of Matt Crowley's 1968 hit play, The Boys in the Band, opened at the Booth Theater on Broadway. The Broadway revival of Boys in the Band ran until August 11th, eight shows a week, every week for 10 or 12 weeks. If you don't know the show, it's a famous and really important piece of theater about a group of gay friends living in Manhattan before Stonewall. It was, in 1968, this incredibly searing and realistic portrait of gay life. When the revival opened in 2018, it showed us how far we've come And it showed us what those who seek to push gay people back into the closet want to return us to. Lives warped and destroyed by shame. I saw the production. It was amazing. An all-star cast, all openly gay actors playing the boys in the band. Zachary Quinto, Jim Parsons, Andrew Rannells, directed by a gay man, Joe Mantello. And it was, it was amazing. And you don't have to take my word for it. Won the 2018 Tony Award for Best Revival of a Play. Anyway, I have a point to make, a relevant point to something in the news right now, but a little bit more about the show first. Very early in the show, one of the boys in the band, Donald, stripped naked and took a shower, live, on stage. And Donald was portrayed by Golden Globe winning film and television star Matt Bomber, who is one of the hottest men, not just in Hollywood, but on the planet. It's not for nothing that Channing Tatum cast Bomber in Magic Mike, And Bomber is not just the most amazing cheekbones you've ever seen hovering a few feet above the most amazing ass you've ever seen. Bomber is a really good actor. Anyway, I I promise I have a point. And my point is hundreds of gay men packed into the Booth Theater over the summer of 2018 to watch, well, Boys in the Band, of course, but also all those gay men got to watch Matt fucking Bomber take off all his clothes and take a shower right in front of them. Terry and I were two of the gay men who sat in the Booth Theater that summer and watched Matt Bomber take a shower. And not one of the gay men in that theater during the run of Boys in the Band in the summer of 2018 at the Booth Theater, not one of the gay men who watched Matt Bomber get naked and take a shower, not one was escorted from the theater for groping his date during the show. The same can't be said for Congresswoman Lauren Boebert, who represents Colorado's 3rd Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives, who this weekend was escorted from a theater in Denver, Colorado, because she and her date were, quote, behaving inappropriately during a production of Beetlejuice, which I haven't seen, but I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that it doesn't feature a naked Matt Bomber taking a shower, so there's no excuse Bobert was initially ejected from the theater for vaping and just generally being an asshole, waving her arms around, standing, taking flash photographs during the performance. And when it made the news, Bobert issued a statement lying and denying that she was vaping, which everyone sitting around her had seen and complained about. So the theater, at the request of the media, released the security video, which they were legally obligated to do at the request of the media. And that video not only showed Bobert vaping, but showed Bobert groping. Her date groping her tits, but Bobert groping her date's cock through his pants with both hands. Bobert's hands running up and down her date's cock. This is the same Bobert who tweeted, take your children to church, not drag bars. Okay, we're just going to set aside the fact that there are multiple news stories every day about children being raped in the churches Bobert would like you to take your children to and zero news stories about children being raped in drag bars. There were children all over the theater where Bobert saw Beetlejuice and Lord knows how many children have seen the video of Bobert jerking off her date now. And no, despite the protestations of liberals on Twitter who seem determined to make me repeat Bob Dole's definition of a liberal, someone who won't take his own side in an argument, Bobert's privacy was not invaded. She was not the victim of revenge porn. For Christ's sake, she was in a theater with hundreds of other people, a theater packed full of children jerking off her date during a performance of Beetlejuice. And it's not slut-shaming either. 
to point out that Bobert is a hypocrite. As the volatile mermaid put it, it's not slut shaming to tell someone not to jerk their partner off in public, especially when that someone claims drag shows are indecent and harmful to children. Hope that clears things up. In a statement released after she was exposed as a public groper and a liar about it and a vapor and a liar about it, Bobert tried to explain away her behavior that night at Beetlejuice by saying she succumbed to, quote, the natural anxiety of being in a new environment. I guess we've all been there, unfamiliar place, unfamiliar experience, vape, take flash photos, jerk off the person sitting to your right. The hypocrisy is staggering. She should be ashamed of herself for acting like an asshole in a theater, for giving hand jobs to Democrats. Apparently her date is a liberal Democrat who owns a bar in Aspen that hosts drag shows. Still wondering how that part of this news story is going to play with Bobert's MAGA base. But of course, none of this is going to matter. Bobert isn't going to resign in disgrace because you can't shame the shameless. And pointing out hypocrisy to hypocrites is a waste of time. And if you've been paying attention, there's nothing inconsistent here about Bobert's behavior or the double standards she wishes to enforce. It's not new. It's long been anything goes for straight people. All through the debate over gay marriage in the 90s and aughts, we were told marriage is defined by monogamy, religion, and kids. So gay people weren't allowed to marry. But straight people could marry without being monogamous, being religious, or having kids. The standards that supposedly disqualified gay people from marriage, we are less likely to be monogamous, have kids, or be religious, somehow didn't disqualify straight people who weren't monogamous, didn't want kids, or weren't religious from marrying. Traditional morality for thee, whatever the fuck I want for me. That is the GOP. And this was the GOP long before Donald grabbed him by the pussy Trump and long before the hypocritical family values grope me conservatism of Lauren Boebert. Right now, Lauren Boebert, despite her best efforts, has a halfway decent chance of getting reelected to a third term in Congress in 2024. And here's the thing. The galling thing. If she manages to get reelected to a third term in the House, if she works for six years, she qualifies for a congressional pension, which means if Boebert gets a third term, we, taxpayers, will be cutting that woman who opposes all benefits for working people, for families with children, for giving student loan debt, we will be cutting that woman a check for the rest of her life. The good news? Lauren Boebert's opponent in 2022 Democrat Adam Frisch came within 546 votes of defeating her, and Frisch is running against Boebert again in 2024. You may have enjoyed what you thought were laughs at Boebert's expense over the weekend. Social media was on fire, but those laughs didn't really cost Boebert anything. But if you laugh all the way to Adam Frisch's website and chuckle to yourself while you make a donation, Boebert's performance this weekend in Denver? Yeah could end up costing her her seat in Congress with your help. AdamForColorado.com. Click donate. All right. And if you didn't make it to New York during the run of Boys in the Band at the Booth Theater and you're sad about missing out on what was an amazing show and missing out on Matt Bomber naked, taking a shower live on stage, I have good news for you. The entire cast of the 2018 Broadway revival, including Bomber, recreated their performances in the 2020 film version of Boys in the Band that you can watch right now. Well, not right now, right after you make a donation at adamforcolorado.com. And then you can go to Netflix and watch Matt Bomber and Zachary Quinto and Jim Parsons and Andrew Rannells and a stellar cast in Boys in the Band. All right, the Hump 2023 tour continues this weekend. Hump is coming to Oakland, California, then Minneapolis, Sacramento, Reno, Juneau, Los Angeles, and Palm Springs in the coming weeks. Go to humpfilmfest.com for tickets to a screening or for tickets to a streaming. You can watch Hump at home. All right, coming up on today's show, tons of your cues, lots of my A's. And this week's guest is Tawny Lara. Tawny Lara is an advice columnist, better known as the Sober Sexpert, author of the new book, Dry Humping, a guide to dating, relating, and hooking up without the booze. There's a little bit of my conversation with Tawny on the micro to get the whole thing. Become a Magnum sub now at savage.love. All right, all that coming up on today's show. This episode is brought to you by Field, a dating app where the open-minded can meet the like-minded. Download Field for free and get access 
to a free month of Majestic membership by going to feeld.co slash savage. Hi, Dan. I'm a 50-year-old by woman living just outside of Toronto, Canada. I am in a very loving, committed DS relationship with my man who's also bi. He is a very good pet and is very skilled at serving his queen. That said, he engages in a lot of ass worship, which is fairly new to me. So my question to you is this. He desperately wants to eat slash take something from me that's been in my ass. I am very open and sexually free, but I got to say something about this just makes me blush. I mean, I've participated in numerous threesomes. I've sucked two cocks in one sitting. I've been DP'd in the pussy, but somehow letting him do this seems, well, extra. I am willing to do this because I'm a generous goddess, but I'm not sure what I should let him eat. He often suggests licorice, but I feel like that would be kind of painful because it's ridgy. I've let him lick pudding off of my asshole, but he would like to do more. Do you have any suggestions for something sexy and safe? You said extra. I heard extra. Look, if this is a hard limit for you, if shoving something in your ass and letting your pet eat that thing out of your butt is too poop adjacent symbolically for you to feel comfortable doing it, you don't have to do it. You can be a generous goddess and have limits as a top. Tops are allowed to have limits. You're not just a seeing Pez dispenser for your bottom or your sub. It's wonderful. Tops, bottoms, 100% vanilla, whatever your thing is to want to lean in, to borrow a phrase, to meet your partner's needs and to fulfill their fantasies. But if there's just something that squicks you out in a way that trips your circuit breakers, you can say, yeah, no, you can eat pudding off my ass and that's as close as you're going to get to eating pudding out of my butt. Most people who are into ass play, ass worship, my favorite kind of worship service, frankly, um, any sort of butt sex, there's this suspension of disbelief that, that, that people, most people, I see you poop fetishist, but most people are pretending that this doesn't happen, that this orifice isn't the means by which we excrete poops. Uh, just like most people suck and dick are sort of not thinking about urine coming out of that same hole at the end of that dick. The stigma and the shame and the disgust that we all attach, I think quite rightly, to excrement means we have to work a little bit harder or suspend our disbelief a little bit harder when we're engaged in ass play and we don't want to be reminded of this thing that provokes in many people a visceral disgust reaction. Now, there are ways in which erotically disgust and eroticism sit very closely together. And there is some, oh, this is so wrong. What we're doing this ass worship, I'm worshiping your ass. And that is so wrong. And it makes me so low. Like we are tapping into something about what the ass means at that moment, even though we are still walling off what the ass does. Look, if shoving things up your butt and then pooping them into his mouth is too poopy for you, just say no. Just say no. You don't have to put licorice in your butt or a frozen banana in your butt or anything in your butt. You are meeting most of his erotic needs around submission. You are not required to meet all of his erotic needs around submission. If this is something that's necessary for his sense of sexual fulfillment and agency and completion, let him go do it. Let him go poo it with somebody else. Hey, Dan and the tech savvy at risk youth. I have a weird one for you. I was sitting on the couch with my husband last night and he is addicted to these dried mango snacks. He gets up every five seconds to go get one when we have them in stock. And I jokingly said, oh, if you're going to keep on getting up and getting those snacks, put it on my ass and eat it off of my ass. <laughs> and he jokingly complied. But when he did it, it actually felt really great. And I asked him to chew it again. And he did because he still thought I was kidding. But I 
actually really enjoyed it a lot. And I think this is becoming a new kink for me. But he's apprehensive about continuing to do this because he thinks it's weird. Dan, is this weird? How do I talk him into continuing this silly thing that I really enjoy but I know is weird? We snack on a lot of dried mango at my house. I'm trying to picture the scene that you describe, eating it off your ass. Did you lay these pieces of dried mango across your asshole or just were they resting on your butt cheeks? Inquiring minds want to know. Of course, dried mango would make a terrible insertion toy option for the previous caller. And I assume that's not what you were doing because dried mango kind of has rough and sharp edges. So we're just going to go with he laid pieces of dried mango on your butt cheeks and lifted them off with his lips and his teeth. Yeah. Is it weird? Yeah, it's weird. Most people do not eat dried mango off ass. Is it wrong? Is it bad? Is it something that he should feel in my opinion, the least bit inhibited about doing again? No, but I'm not him and he feels a little inhibited. That's what you should talk to him about. Like we did this a couple of times and it was kind of fun and silly and it surprised me by being really pleasurable. And now you don't want to do it. Why? Um, what, what, what are, where are these reservations coming from? And then drill down on that issue. Maybe he feels that this is the first step toward incorporating a lot of food into sex, or this is something you're going to expect every time. And if you can reassure him that you're not going to become one of those people who thinks that food and sex belong. I I actually am very opposed to mixing food and sex. I think food is for well before sex or sometimes immediately after sex, but like dumping food on people's bodies and eating it off is kind of my opinion, not sexy. Sex is sensuous. Licking someone is sensuous. Eating food is sensuous, but these things don't necessarily enhance each other, except in your experience with these mangoes. Sure. Okay. I will allow it, but I can't compel it. I can't force your husband to do this for you again. Have a conversation with him about why this feels like such a big deal, something he doesn't want to do again. And maybe this is something that you can do. Like if it's an inhibition, we all have inhibitions and we all have moments of disinhibition. And Clearly, if he did it twice already, there were moments of disinhibition for him around eating mango off your butt. One last theory on what might be going through his head was that he thought it was just silly, goofy fun. And the fact that it turned you on, he can't see why this would be a turn on necessarily. And is a little squicked out, this, this thing that felt like pranky to him or goofy, stupid to him was arousing to you. And he is a little, not put off, but a little confused about how this could be erotic to you, why it's erotic to you. And it opened up to him what, you know, one partner might regard as an exciting mystery, but he may regard as a bit of an intimidating mystery as to why this would turn you on. So in addition to having the conversation about inhibitions, uh, you should have a conversation about why this worked for you. And what's exciting about it for you and why you want to do it with him again. And then kick that ball into his court. This is a low stakes ask. Eat some mango off my ass. If he knows you want to do it again, a moment will come. A moment will come where he's eating mango on the couch and your ass is sitting there. And if he knows you want to do it and you've had a conversation about it and he's feeling silly and disinhibited, I bet he'll come through. I bet you will once again get that mango eaten off your peach. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is sponsored by Field, the dating app where the open-minded can meet the like-minded. Find what you're looking for, even if you're not sure what that is yet. Sometimes looking for it helps clarify what it is that you want. Find it on Field. It's the dating app designed for the curious. You can find friends, lovers, partners, and everything in between. 40% of members of Field identify as LGBTQIA+. 35% of users are part of a couple. And 100% of Field users are on Field looking to explore or connect. And 100% of everybody on Field is there to explore connection in new ways. 
Here are some of the reasons Field works so well for Savage Lovecast listeners. The app is inclusive to all, no matter your gender or sexual orientation. Field has 20 sexuality and gender identity options to choose from. You can pair profiles with a partner and easily explore ethical non-monogamy or polyamory with Field. Field values sex positivity. It's really all about sex positivity. And Field encourages you to share your desires and interests directly on your profile so that people know what you are into and what you are looking for. From cuddling and long kisses to three ways, BDSM, Shibari, or one big night with cuddling, kisses, BDSM, and Shibari, you can be open from the beginning and connect with like-minded folks in a space created for safe and ethical exploration. Find yourself, find your desires, find your people on Field. For a limited time, you'll receive a free month of Majestic membership when you download the Field app for the first time. Just use the link in the show notes to download Field or head to field.co slash savage and access one free month of Majestic membership. That's F-E-E-L-D dot C-O slash savage. All right, Dan, let's talk about sobriety and boners. I am a 57-year-old hetero man. I've been sober for 11 years now. Most of that time I was married. And in sobriety, I, I work a program and everything. In sobriety, I learned that I should not be in that marriage. It took until last year for that to finalize, which in time I became sexually active I learned a lot in sobriety about myself, but what I didn't learn was about relationships and about sex. I hadn't, that was a loveless, sexless marriage for many, many years. So there's a lot of anxiety going into dating and especially having sex. I had never had sex sober at least since I was a teenager, maybe through my twenties and everything was always loaded and having sex then that gave me confidence and just nothing got in the way when uh, I was socially lubricated with uh, alcohol no emotions no nerves or anything got in the way I did get some meds to sort of preemptively take and and sometimes I've done that I, I don't know that I necessarily need them but there have been a couple of times where mid coitus I had had lost it I believe that to be all in my head and I'm hoping this is normal and I'm hoping that's what I hear is yeah that that happens you're you know this is new to you and that sort of thing I think everything's working fine I'm in good shape I'm 170 pounds 510 I run 10 20 miles uh, a week I eat good I lift weights um, I'm in really good shape I sometimes wait well almost every day I wake up five o'clock in the morning with a with a boner. So I think all the parts are working right, but there's just some of these times where I think it's just nerves. Have you heard of this? Does this sound normal that somebody sort of new to this sex and dating world might have some, some nerves or mental blocks with their boner? Joining me to help tackle this question, Tawny Laura, an advice columnist better known as the Sober Sexpert and the author of the new book, Dry Humping, A Guide to Dating, Relating, and Hooking Up Without the Booze. Hey, Tawny, thank you so much for coming on the Savage Lovecast. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Let's leave this guy, his question, and his boners aside for a moment and just talk about sobriety in general. So we're dating, actually, in specific, or dry humping, which is a great <laughs> title. You say this book is for the sober curious. I've heard of the bi curious, kick curious, poly curious, not so much the sober curious. Who are the sober curious? Yeah, sober curious is it's a term that was created by an author, Ruby Warrington, who quite literally wrote the book called Sober Curious about people who are just curious about reevaluating their relationship with alcohol. And I think I think her work is brilliant because she really tapped into this large community of people that maybe want to drink less or want to quit drinking altogether, but they don't want to go to an AA meeting. They don't want to work the steps, but they, they acknowledge that there is something off and they, they want to be more mindful or just completely not drink at all. And so that is, you know, this book is for sober curious people. Uh, there's another term called dry dating. That's a trend right now. People that 
still drink alcohol, but they are not wanting to drink while they're dating or hooking up or for someone like me in recovery. So you had a different path to sobriety yourself, a similar origin story to many, including many people in my uh, extended family who find themselves developing a problematic relationship with booze. You worked in the restaurant industry. You were a bartender, but your path to sobriety didn't involve AA or rehab. Can you tell us about how you got sober? Yeah, definitely. I, I come from a bartender party girl. Like think of your stereotypical girl, like woo on the dance floor and on the bar top. That was definitely me. I hope um, you were never the woo girl in the gay bar though. <laughs> were you? Oh my God. I, I was, uh, I was part of the problem for sure, <laughs> but I am fixed and all of my problems are solved now. So rest assured. You are forgiven. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. So I, I lived that party girl bartender life and I grew up in central Texas, Waco, Texas. And then I moved to New York to, you know, follow my dreams and be a writer. And I quickly realized that once I left that bartender scene and made new friends in the writing world, people looked at my relationship with alcohol differently. And by that, I mean, you know, after grabbing drinks after a writing class, I would be the crazy girl who was ordering rounds of shots wanting to get wasted. And people are like, well, it's a Tuesday. Like, what are what are you doing? Like, we're just having a beer. And that was the first time that I really had that mirror raised to me, you know, they weren't judging me. It was just like, oh, not everyone drinks this way. You open by acknowledging a universal truth. People drink that way often Mm -hmm. to lower their inhibitions. That's why we have singles bars and pickup joints and not single farmers markets and pickup podiatrists. Booze really does help some people get over their inhibitions and under someone they'd like to get under. Yes. Can it be good for people? I mean, I, in the book, I acknowledge that alcohol really helped me get through some really tough shit. You know, it helped me get through some tough times. And I now understand that I was self-medicating anxiety, depression, PTSD. I didn't have the language or the resources back then. And I did what I, I did what I could to get by. And it, it led me here. You know, I'm um, in November, I'll be eight years without alcohol and I'm very, very grateful for that, for that journey. But it's, I, you know, I didn't do 12 step. I didn't do AA. I yoga, writing, um, mm-hmm. meditation. Like I, I really, we, we call it a sobriety toolkit. Like you, we kind of fill these items in our, our mental health toolkit to help us take life one day at a time. So people do experience a lot of anxiety around their sexual interests and desires. There is this enormous body of contested literature about whether or not being on hormonal birth control impacts someone's mate selection. And then they go off hormonal birth control uh, when they want to have a baby, if they ever want to have a baby and suddenly Mm -hmm. like wrong guy. We talk about that a lot. It seems to me that a more common problem might be people are drunk when they date, drunk when they hook up. They go every time they see somebody they're dating for months, they're drinking. And then eventually you're at home with this person that you've never met sober and you may not like sober. Yeah, that and that's such a good comparison. The whole the birth control method that we're all we're all so used to that of like, oh yeah, it's gonna mess with your hormones and your sex drive and all this stuff. But when I quit drinking, I was not preparing to basically learn how to do everything all over again. But in the you know specifically dating, sex, relationships, I had no idea how to do I didn't even know how to date. Like my relationships began in bars. We would get wasted and hook up. Sometimes we would be in a relationship. Sometimes we would move in together. Sometimes it was just a one night stand. But getting sober taught me I didn't know how to actually go on a proper date, let alone have 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 healthy sex, have cons- like these really rich, beautiful, consensual conversations. I had no idea how to do any of that. I had these crazy experiences where I needed to drink to lower my inhibitions to go into a gay bar to talk to gay guys and there were times when the alcohol made it possible for me to meet this guy but the alcohol also ruined the sex with this Mm -hmm. guy that it has this power to lower your inhibitions and annihilate your ability to perform or remember and one of the things a good sexual experience is for is the spank bank it's for the memories because eventually memories are all you're going to have 
Yeah, I mean, it's you, you're speaking to what's called the biphasic quality of alcohol, which means alcohol has these two different phases. One, the first one is like you're saying, maybe you have one drink, you feel a little bit more relaxed, you're a little more flirtatious. That's that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is when the when a you become reliant on that to kind of change your personality to have the courage to do something like hitting on someone, having a difficult conversation with a partner, asking for what you want, asking for what you want in bed. That's that's different. And then the second phase is is the I was going to say problematic, but that sounds judgmental. It's what I was doing, it was problem. It was problematic drinking until the point of blacking out on a regular basis, hooking up, not being safe, not advocating for safety or pleasure for myself. We should live in a world where a woman can get blackout drunk and not be vulnerable to predation. Yes. The reality is we don't live in that world. And yes, the sad reality is we will never live in that world. It is unsafe for anyone to get blackout drunk. I, I completely agree. And alcohol in the Me Too movement is like a whole other thing that I could like go on this tangent about. But it's like you said, you should be able to drink. And if you choose to get wasted, fine. But that doesn't mean you deserve what happens to you. You are still a human. You are still you still have agency. And if someone's going to take advantage of that, that says way more about them than you. Tawny and I had so much more to talk about, including getting your boner back after quitting meth, discovering yourself and your relationships without alcohol, and so much more, which you can hear on the Magnum version of the Savage Lovecast. Try a month of Magnum for just $8. It gives you access to my full Savage Love column struggle session where I get in the comments section and chat with other Magnum subs, my live Zoom shows, and of course, the longer, stronger, uncut version of the Savage Lovecast, the Magnum Savage Lovecast. You can also give Magnum subs as a gift. It's all at savage.love. Tawny's book, Dry Humping a Guide to Dating, Relating, and Hooking Up Without the Booze, is out now wherever you get your books. I had a flexible woman in mid-30s living in France. My last relationship of five years ended 12 years ago. Since then, I've been going on dates, listening to Savage Love, going to therapy and dating while at the same time living a pretty incredible life full of travel, hobbies, work projects and friends. At the beginning of this period of being single, I decided to explore my sexuality and have some adventures while at the same time looking for a relationship. Today, I'm still single and that relationship didn't happen lived in Paris for the past five years and dating here has been worse than ever before. I asked my friends for feedback as recommended by my therapist and they said that seeing as I'm a curvy lady, French men, even if they were really attracted to me, would only sleep with me in secret but wouldn't date me as they would be afraid of what their friends would think. It's a very, very fat phobic place then. I really love my body and take great care of it. I eat healthy and I do a ton of sports. As I'm heading towards my late 30s, I'm feeling disheartened because I know I'm running out of time if I one day want to create a family. What do you think I should do? Should I move to another country where I'm considered hot stuff? Is there a way I should change my approach to dating? Should I just get more cats and call it a day? You shouldn't have to move. And you shouldn't have to settle for guys who will only fuck you in secret but wouldn't want to date you publicly. And if there's a guy who really wants to fuck you... Sometimes hearing from the person that you really want to fuck that they're not going to fuck you on the down low motivates a person who's closeted, for whatever reason they might be closeted, to get the fuck over themselves because there's this person they want to be with and that person isn't going to settle for being their dirty little secret. I have been there. I have done that. Not around size but around sexual orientation where I was – dating closeted guys in my very early 20s and late teens. And eventually I just hit a wall where I was like, this isn't worth it. I'm not going to do this anymore. And if you want to be with me, you have to be out about being with me. You can lay the same chip down. That might cost you some dick. There might be some guys that would have fucked you on the down low, could have been really good dick, wouldn't fuck you if it meant having to be seen in public with you. Do you really want to fuck those guys? Do you really want to put up with as good as that makes the inside of your vagina feel, how that's going to make the inside of your psyche feel? I don't think so. So use the leverage that you have, which is your presence. It's a different, it's a kind of a variation on that advice. But also, man, 
you, you shouldn't have to move. But people do move all the time to places where their body type makes dating easier for them, where they have more possibilities. People move all the time to places where their sexual orientation or their preferred relationship model is more marketable, more desirable, less scary to people. A lot of people, straight people who want to be in polyamorous relationships have headed for San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, especially 20 years ago because that's where the poly people were clumping up. A lot of trans people move to certain places, achieve a certain critical mass of numbers, and then the possible dating pool expands for them. And like certainly gay men and lesbians over the course of all of recorded human history have clumped up in urban areas because we're such a tiny percent of the population that for there to be some options, you don't have to sleep with the closeted priest in your small town of 500 people. That's your only boyfriend option. Move to the big city. It wouldn't be, I think, a betrayal of your love for yourself, of your own acceptance of your body, love of your body, for you to take your fucking body to a place where there are more people who want to fuck your body, but also love your body, date your body, make a family with you and your body. That is a reasonable choice. It feels like an admission of defeat. I shouldn't have to leave the small town that I grew up in, in rural fucking downstate Illinois or Kentucky and move to Chicago. I shouldn't have to leave this place I love just because there aren't people here who could love me. But okay, then stay on principle, I guess. And your options are radically decreased. So I guess this is me saying if French beauty standards make you miserable and the stigma around being seen with beautiful women who look like you, who are your size, is so crushing and the French men who are attracted to you are such fucking cowards, yeah, in your shoes, I would move. I would personally take my ass somewhere where there were people who wanted to fuck it and be seen with it and date it and eat mango off it. All right, before we get to this week's listener response calls, I want to share a couple of comments left on last week's show at savage.love. Says Phil, the call from the woman who self-harmed in response to her husband acting on their open relationship was disturbing. Instead of having a conversation, sharing their insecurities, and renegotiating boundaries, the caller held her own body hostage. Frankly, this person doesn't sound mentally well enough to handle any adult relationship, let alone an open one. In defense of the caller, she did reach out seeking input and advice. That is a good sign that she actually is in a place where she can handle an adult relationship. The question is whether she can handle an adult open relationship. All right, this next comment is really important. I took a question last week from a woman with five partners. She came down with chlamydia. Everyone else in her polycule got tested. No one else had chlamydia. So was this an immaculate infection or was someone lying about their test results? Dr. Kent Tischer wrote in to point out what I missed. A lot of medical providers don't test for anal or throat gonorrhea or chlamydia, which requires a separate test and is more likely to be asymptomatic. It's an entirely plausible scenario that the caller picked up genital chlamydia from one of their partner's throats, and then when their partner quote-unquote got tested, they only had their genitals checked. In this scenario, the person with the throat chlamydia still has it, but thinks they are not infected because the wrong test was done. All right, I'm spoiled by my experiences over the years, over the decades, with my great gay doctor, because every STI test or screening I've ever gotten, everything got tested and screened. So I have a blind spot here brought on by the high quality, thorough sexual health care I've been receiving all these years. So people, when you go to see your doc for an STI test or screening, if they didn't test your throat and your asshole, as well as your junk, you didn't get a full STI test. Make sure that you are getting everything you're using tested. And finally, says KM, I'm still mad about the naked book club fuckery. Some questions. One, what if a woman joins and she doesn't explicitly out herself as trans? Two, is the book club organizer going to ask all new members who join whether they're trans or not? 
three, how uncomfortable will this would-be trans woman member of the club be when she finds out that before she could join, the server had to be dismissed? Four, how obvious will it be to all other attendees that the newest member is trans since the server was dismissed when she joined? As a trans person, Dan, I'm so angry about this. This is a feminist book club. No, why the fuck would you start it off by enacting some sort of gender policing bullshit? Gah! All right, for more listener comments and more of my responses, check out Struggle Session, posted on Thursdays at savage.love, where I respond to comments, emails, and DMs. It's another perk for my Magnum subs. For all the perks, become one of my subs right now at savage.love. And KM, who is still angry about the book club fuckery, I will be answering your questions to the best of my ability in this week's Struggle Session. And now, listener response calls. Hi, I'm calling with a comment on your response to the woman in the poly couple in a German city who had a boundary about sleepovers. I think that it was the man's responsibility to tell this new potential interest before they hooked up that sleepovers were not an option. I don't think it said whether or not he had told the date that. If he didn't, that's really on him. If he told the date that and she fell asleep, then wake her up. I mean, that was the agreement. I know she's a person too, but she also has a responsibility in this. Hi, Dan. I'm calling in response to the 76-year-old caller in episode 881 asking about the spine-tingling orgasms he used to experience before he started producing ejaculate as a teen and that returned once his semen production waned with age. I'm a nurse practitioner, and you're right. I don't know of any hard scientific studies done in this area to explain the phenomenon. However, I do prescribe gender-affirming hormone therapy to transgender folks, and this reminded me of something a lot of my patients have anecdotally told me. My trans-feminine patients often tell me that as their estrogen estrogen levels rise and their testosterone levels decrease, their orgasms change from more of a genital-centric experience to more of an intense full-body tingling sensation. Similarly, my transmasculine patients often tell me that as their testosterone levels rise, their orgasms become more localized to their genitals. So I'm thinking the caller might have been having a more full-body orgasm that has to do with the relatively decreased testosterone levels of early adolescence and older adulthood compared to the higher testosterone levels of young adulthood. Hey, this is a response for a dad who was squished out by his kid enjoying ASMR and saying that they feel satisfied. I think a lot of society up until now has really tamed us to keep us from indulging in those simple pleasures and really makes no room for us to just savor and enjoy. So I love that the next generation is tapping into those senses and are potentially bringing that into adulthood, knowing um, just what is satisfying and pleasurable on a base level. Maybe they'll have a whole lot less to unpack in the future. To the dad, maybe just find out what's kind of pleasurable to you, but in like a satisfying way, and then share that with the kids. It might make room for better connections. And we're going to leave it there. Got a question for next week's Lovecast or something to say about something I said on this week's Lovecast? Go to savage.love slash askdan right now while that question or comment is fresh in your mind and record it for us. Or you can use the voice memo app on your phone and email your question or comment to q at savage.love. And you can also call us still on the Savage Love hotline at 206-302-2064 and leave a message. The deadline for submitting a film for Hump, my dirty little film festival, Hump 2024, is a couple of months away. So now is a great time to get to work on your film for Hump. Not only don't you have to pay to enter your five minute or less film in Hump, if your film makes it into the festival, you get paid. All the details are at humpfilmfest.com slash submit. Follow me on Instagram and threads at Dan Savage. Follow me on Blue Sky at Dan Savage. And you can still find me now and then in the bad place at the Dan Savage. Follow Tawny Laura, the sober sex expert, on Instagram and Twitter at Tawny M. Laura. You can also pre order her terrific new book with the terrific title Dry Humping at her website, tawnylaura.com. Savage Lovecast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and Nancy and the tech savvy at risk youth. We will all be back at you next week for another installment of the Savage Lovecast. Thank you for downloading. Mm-hmm.